Okay, <clears throat> back for part two of the 19th century industrial and uh, industrial revolution and <clears throat> imperial growth of Great Britain. So we're going to start out today just talking about the industrial revolution first. Um, we've already talked about the Civil War last week <clears throat> and how devastating that was to the southern states in particular. Um, Slavery was at the center of the entire uh, conflict from the very beginning. And as soon as the United States came into existence, that contradiction uh, predicted there was almost civil war, politically at least, <clears throat> in 1800 uh, between John Adams and Thomas Jefferson, the, the second and third presidents of the United States, when the party system began to assert itself. The Republican experiment, the Democratic experiment of the United States <clears throat> was constantly in jeopardy. And uh, Abraham Lincoln steering his way through the Civil War, um, eventually leading to the victory by the Union, um, is why Abraham Lincoln is so famous, um, in addition to the fact that he officially f freed the slaves. In the background of all of this, <clears throat> the Industrial Revolution was taking place. Uh, Great Britain industrialized first. So we are going to talk about uh, the factors that led to that happening. Uh, after Great Britain industrialized, uh, shortly after Germany and uh, the Low Countries, the Netherlands, uh, the United States and France started to the process as well. But uh, there was a big head start. You might say that uh, the British had maybe decades on the other countries, and they, they did try to prevent the technology uh, from spreading and, and from being copied. But inevitably, uh, it was shared or stolen or exported to other countries. The United States, uh, having its huge amount of resources and, uh, you know, a geographic advantage by being far away from any of its real enemies, mostly fighting itself during the 19th century, made sure that they caught up fairly quickly. But um, at first, at least, there was just one country that was really um, going through the process at first, <clears throat> which was Great Britain. And uh, it started before America separated, even, in the, the 18th century, in the 1750s. The three main factors, and I'll need my marker for this. Industrialization. We've got a lot of stuff on the board already, but I don't want to erase it because these are the, the things that you need to focus on on the quiz. Key points. Um, the use of iron as a material. Uh, there's been machines. There were machines, of course, long before industrialization happened, but those machines were often made of wood uh, or other, you know, weaker materials. So the, the frame of any machine was going to um, possibly break, not be able to handle tension or power that uh, ironworking would allow them to do. So the first thing that needed to happen was um, technology, techniques for using iron, for smelting, for getting it out of the ground and processes for for making iron and then later steel. But in the first industrial revolution, it's iron. <clears throat> There's lots of problems with iron. It, it, it uh, doesn't have the, the flexibility or tensile strength of steel and it, it rusts. So you've got to do quite a bit of maintenance, but just as a material with its strength, uh, it, was be, it would be able to handle way more pressure, way more power, way more weight. Um, it could it could move at faster speeds than the other materials that were um, used for making machines before that. Um, so you could you couldn't make an automobile, for example, out of uh, wood. It would set on fire or it would you know, break fairly quickly. Um, the great ships uh, that we'll talk about soon when we talk about the Royal Navy and, and Admiral Nelson. I just finished watching a great. Uh, documentary on 
the HMS Victory, which was the, the ship that Nelson uh, captained. And they were literally <clears throat> the, the greatest, most complicated weapons of their time. 200 years ago, um, it's the, the aircraft carrier of the 1800s uh, is, are these huge ships that have a hundred cannons on them and ropes and, and wood and, and metal and hundreds and hundreds of people um, moving all these parts. It, it's a great machine, um, but it's not a machine in the same sense as, um, you know, a, a cotton ginny is something, a weaving machine um, that multiplies the work of, of many people. It um, just is a incredibly complicated system that uh, developed as, as a means to control the ocean. Um, almost almost like uh, the modern battleship or uh, now the aircraft carriers are for for powerful countries so iron it was actually as, as far as I'm I'm aware um, the technique was was developed in Sweden and then imported to to uh, the British and the British uh, just used this means of producing iron high quality iron that was developed by the Swedish um, to build their machines and the main resource that they tapped to process were textiles we talked about this already this is a huge factor in the development of the American economy because uh, in the south they the plantation system um, the, the main product was cotton which they re referred to as king cotton because it was so essential um, it, we're talking about uh, portions of the the economy that are way out of proportion to anything you know the the United States has a very complex sophisticated diverse economy now um, in the beginning there was tobacco and then there was other products they started developing you know uh, planting indigo which is a dye um, rice which is a staple food and cotton and sugar, uh, all of these things um, in the south could be grown in big quantities and um, the labor pool was um, expanded by importing people from Africa and enslaving them and, <clears throat> and using them to uh, produce these, these uh, resources that were in very high demand in Europe. And as um, America started industrializing, they, they started, you know, producing the finished goods uh, in the north. Uh, and this is the relationship that the United States had with itself going into the American Civil War. But they were also exporting huge amounts of cotton to um, England. And as I mentioned last, last lecture, the, the first of the two parts, India was so important, uh, partially because India was a place where they could grow some of these things once they lost the colonies in America uh, they, and they had Jamaica but not very many really tropical climates where they could grow things um, in big quantities and India had all the 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 um, prerequisites to be uh, the resource pr producing giants that it is um, now and it was then too so once they started you know having big cotton plantations in uh, India, they were relied less on the United States. But um, that, that was not the case um, at the, in the early 1800s. That hadn't happened yet. The expansion of British influence in India had a lot to do with the fact that they lost their colonies in North America. And India became, as I said, South Asia became the most important uh, area of the British Empire. It, it was the thing that sustains the British Empire. It wouldn't have really been able to uh, handle um, colonizing Australia or or Canada even if it hadn't had all that um, wealth being extracted from from India. So yeah, the um, main product here is clothing, uh, cloths for all different types of purposes. Um, Everything you can think of uh, might need, you know, um, cloth as a fundamental 
um, support. Uh, if the military needs uniforms, people need to wear clothes, um, houses and, and beds, blankets, right? Uh, cloth was universally needed uh, and needed to be replaced too once they started making cheaper and, and um, mass producing cloth. Uh, the, the quality started to drop as well. So it needed to be replaced. Not only did you, you, were you able to buy more of them, instead of having, if you were a poor person, having two or three shirts um, you know, at a time, uh, you would have a dozen, right? And they would wear out fairly quickly. And instead of repairing them, you just throw them out and replace them. This is pretty much um, the way that our world works now. You don't, lots of people don't anyway repair their clothes because it's it's not even worth it because as soon as you patch one part there's going to be another part i don't repair my shirts but i'll be honest i um i wear my jeans as long as i can and i get them patched because jeans are expensive and the material is tough but anyway denim has not been invented yet so right now we're talking about cotton and cotton being turned into linen and cloth and this um unit um uh, in the economy is called the textile industry. So that'll be the word that I use on the quiz and the test. Uh, so you got iron, you got textiles. So the the main, the third factor that is most significant, and you'll find if you Google the Industrial Revolution, you'll probably find that people uh, talk about different factors that go into the Industrial Revolution. But this is the the three factors that I've chosen and other people have too, um, <clears throat> that changed dramatically. And we can talk about the economy, we can talk about capitalism and Adam Smith, and you should read about that. Um, he wrote something called The Invisible Hand, and having the money available, like none of this would have happened. Um, one of the reasons that it happened in Britain, I should say, and it, it didn't happen in other places because the sophistication of the commercial and financial system, right? The, the British economy um, grew beyond its, its population size for its day. <clears throat> In the middle of the 19th century, the British Empire is going to pass China as the biggest economy in the world. And with, with a population, I mean, if you include all of the, the, the colonies and their populations, um, the British eventually are going to surpass the Chinese because there are more people in the British Empire than there are in the in the Chinese Empire. But uh, at first, at least, <clears throat> as they start to industrialize, they're they're multiplying the productivity of each individual. Um, and China doesn't need to do this. That's the thing. India and China don't need to do it because they they have so many people that industrialization isn't necessary because they have a, a gigantic labor pool. But for the British, to fight the French Empire, first of all, um, France has a population that's, you know, when Napoleon starts mobilizing um, to fight, France's population is, is uh, multiple times bigger than the British Isles. So just, if you take nation to nation, like the, the metropole, Paris, and France as a country, as a nation, and look at it compared to the United Kingdom, including Scotland and Ireland, if you want to as well. Um, although Ireland doesn't have the same status as Scotland as a partner. You just take those populations um, and and uh, the, the labor pool, the manpower, the population of France is much, much larger. Um, so they can, I mean, in the 18th century, they they can pull a lot more tax revenue because they have more people. Uh, and they have a different government system, so they can they can push their tax rates higher without having a rebellion or a civil war. We talked about this a lot. Um, people have this. There's an expression, as I said before, death and taxes. Right? If too many people get killed or their taxes get pushed too high, then at least in English culture, that's the breaking point. That's going to start um, protests. It's going to start complaining first, then protests, then violence in the form of damage of property and resistance, and then rebellion, and then possibly in the end, revolution, right? Uh, that's what happened in America. So 
what's going to happen now, and I think this is the revolutionary, the real revolutionary part, is, is the Industrial Revolution actually a revolution? By some, by some standards, it's not. I think some revolutionaries, if I may um, quote, I'm not going to quote somebody, um, if I may refer to somebody's opinion, um, I can't really quote Chinese, but Mao Zedong, the, the communist leader of China, um, he, he was a revolutionary. There's no doubt about that. He changed um, a lot of things in China. And once he got power, it was, it, was a, it was about, there had to be violence. There had to be speed and violence. It had to, things had to change fast for it to truly be a revolution. That's what you call a revolutionary uh, individual, right? Or a revolutionary period. It's like the French Revolution overnight, seemingly, it's, it's a matter of years, but in a few years, um, the government changes and the political system changes and the social system changes and even the religion gets overturned uh, and then, then there's war and war in France with itself and war with all the European countries and then Napoleon comes along and you, you see the difference between France in 1789 uh, and 20 years later in 1809 and, and it's uh, Napoleonic Empire and all the different things that happened in between it's it's mind-boggling it's dizzying that's not really how the Industrial Revolution works it's like a slow revolution so as I said before this book is called evolution and revolution the Industrial Revolution is more of an industrial evolution and it's still going on there's still countries in, around the world that are still going through industrialization through the first and second stages. And some people are calling this the fourth industrial revolution, the, the AI, uh, digital, you know, robotics, space exploration stage. We're, we're getting to the point where we're, we're on the fourth stage of it. And so that's 250 years of revolution. That is a term that some professors and scholars use Pretty loosely. We talk about the agricultural revolution too. The agricultural revolution took thousands of years to go from one place to another. It was happening in Mesopotamia, in China, in India, and Europe was much later. Um, some of the, the sort of um, approaches of farming never happened in North America and South America because they didn't have horses. They didn't have oxen. They didn't have elephants. Um, they had, you know, Llamas, which are terrible, terrible domesticated uh, workers. So this is the power factor, right? We talk about horsepower still, like how many horsepower is your car? It's 400 horsepower. Um, that's because for 5,000 years or so, the measurement of, of speed, transportation, and power was uh, how many horses you had. It's a, it's a simple multiplier. Uh, if I was a rich farmer and I had four horses or ten horses, uh, I could manage a much, much larger, <coughs> excuse me, much, much larger farm, much, much larger area than if I just had um, my children and myself or one horse. So you've got a, you know, a bigger land area and you have a force multiplier measured by horses. So the, for... Originally, we just had manpower. It, humans did it, you know, themselves, carried things, moved things, pushed things. Uh, and then we started domesticating animals, um, oxen, and eventually the horse. And then we started getting technology to, to um, control the horse's movement and make it more efficient for a horse to, to plow ground, for example. Um, that's where John Deere, the famous, maybe you don't know the company, but... I grew up in the Canadian countryside and John Deere is everywhere. It's a tractor, agricultural technology company. They sell a lot of farm equipment. It's spelled like this, Deere. And John Deere, the guy who started the company, is the, co the company is named after, um, he, he invented this deep steel um, plow <clears throat> that was used in the prairies in America because a uh, regular plow just couldn't handle the, the, the soil um, type 
it was the prairie soil was very dry and hard and tangled and deep. Uh, so the, this the invention of this plow that John Deere started selling made it possible for people to plow this land, this soil that was unplowable before. Uh, and the horses pulled them originally. And eventually John Deere started, you know, making tractors once the car, the combustion engine was invented. So what kind of power are we talking about? <clears throat> well, not wind power and not water power because those also were already invented. There was windmills in, in the Netherlands. Um, it's one of the symbolic, you know, iconic uh, Dutch symbols is, is the windmill. Um, grinding flour or, or stone or processing wood. There were lumber mills, there were, there were flour mills. Um, and if you had a water source, uh, that water could power the mill to make the machine work. Or if you had, if you were in a windy, you know, area near the sea, uh, like the Netherlands, you could use wind power. So it wasn't just domesticated animals or humans. We also harnessed wind and water, which is much, much more environmentally friendly, as you know. Um, but we we primarily started inventing this this um, these engines um, that were powered by steam, and uh, basically you would have a furnace, with, which was was fed the fuel was usually coal or charcoal made from wood, and you heat it up, and there would be a boiler, and the boiler would would produce steam, and the steam would put pressure down metal metal pipes all these things are made of metal of course that's what I said you can't make these things out of wood um, the power source can't be harnessed um, with different materials uh, that are weaker than iron it, iron was a prerequisite for that so you get a power source steam power <coughs> excuse me steam power steam power and you have your cotton being turned into textiles and if your iron allowing you to build machines, the machines are taking the cotton and turning it into cloth and textiles, and the, the power source is steam. So you end up um, eventually having, you know, one person operating a machine that can do a hundred times more work than a person could do by hand, right? So it's, we still say handmade and stuff, and we all know that for the most part, something that's made made by hand is better quality right unless you're doing some sort of again space technology and you're doing some sort of advanced 3d printing thing um, or you're making you know things out of um, titanium for for space exploration for for the military for weapons but for the for the most part if you're talking about craftsmanship um, still we have tables that are made by machines. Uh, they're not made to be strong. They're not made to be unique. They're made to be plentiful. They're, you make them quickly and they're cheaper to, to produce. They're cheaper to buy. It's a, it, it's a consumer, um, it's a mass production consumer uh, market. Not, not a high quality, you know, um, individualized, um, custom made sort of um, environment, which is what pretty much every economy was based on in Europe um, before the Industrial Revolution came along. There are other ways of mass producing things, of course, slavery being one of them. Um, but when it came to um, selling goods, um, the second Industrial Revolution will come along and uh, Henry Ford will start mass producing cars, for example, and, and revolutionizing the way that things are produced. Uh, even though you have machines, you still have to sort of um, divide the labor uh, into steps, right? So originally, if you bought a shoe um, hundreds of years ago, Shakespeare was going to buy a shoe. Uh, he would have had his shoe, he would have had his um, foot measured. And then, you know, the shoemaker, the cobbler would have um, measured his shoe and then custom made a shoe for him. You'd have to come back a week later or two weeks later. Um, and have your shoes ready and then those shoes you would wear just those shoes all the time and when they started to wear out 
um, you would get them fixed. Unless you were a rich person, um, you would only have one pair of shoes and a couple shirts. And whenever those things were damaged, you would get them repaired, right? Now, everybody has 10 pairs of shoes, and when they wear out, you toss them in the garbage. I don't repair my shoes either. Um, they're made um, to be consumed and thrown away. That is um, what, that's the legacy of the Industrial Revolution for us, is that most of the things that we make, um, you see when somebody moves, especially in Korea, to be honest, um, you see when somebody moves, when they're moving from one house to another, they just throw out like half of their stuff. And it, it blows my mind because I, I've moved, I haven't moved recently, but uh, when I move, I'm, I'm afraid that um, there's going to be like a junkyard in front of my house because none of this stuff is coming with me. Like I'm looking around the room here. This board is going in the trash. I'm pretty sure that's not when I go to my next house, it's not coming with me. I'm looking in my room. You can't see the mess that's in here, but most of these things, chairs and desks and coat hangers, plastic cabinets, they're all going to go in the, the garbage when I move and I'm going to replace them. I, I've had them for probably, I haven't moved for eight years. So that's not a bad life, I guess, for, uh, for a plastic object <clears throat> to keep it for eight years. But nonetheless, um, this, is, uh, this is the downside, the dark side of the Industrial Revolution, right? Um, they, I talk about the second agricultural revolution in the textbook too, so check that out too, please. Um, this is very important because people expect um, the amount of food, the, the population's growing massively, and just like before the Black Death, it seems like it's heading for some sort of catastrophe. And there is a person named... Uh, um, um, John Malthus, um, so it, it's named after him. His name is, sorry, not John, Robert. It's one of those common English names. Uh, anyway, just remember Malthus because it's called a Malthusian trap because he was a minister and um, he was looking forward at the trends and he said, food is being increased, you know, arithmetically, right? Every year we produce a little bit more food but um, population is increasing exponentially. So, you, you know, everybody's having four kids in their family. And when you do that, your population doubles every gen generation, right? Assuming, assuming that a lot of people aren't dying. So, of course, uh, during the century of the Black Death, the Earth's population, the entire world, um, that's why the 13th century is, uh, sorry, the 14th century, I don't know which century I'm talking about, the 1300s, um, that century, the population, the world population didn't increase. Um, and the, the increase of the population globally was generally doubling every few hundred years, but it just froze pretty much for a hundred years, um, which is, as far as I know, um, unique um, in the last several, hundred, several thousand years, mostly because agricultural production has generally increased. But uh, what Malthus didn't realize is that the second in, uh, agricultural revolution would allow us to produce enough food to accommodate this exponential increase in, in people. So we're at 8 billion people now. And John, uh, sorry, John, Robert Malthus, he predicted that we would run out of food long before now. And we do have starvation in parts of the world. I'm not saying that's not the case, but in developed countries, a lot of countries are overproducing. Uh, Canada is one of them that they export. America is another that they're still exporting food because they produce more food than their population can consume. So they're exporting it to countries like South Korea that have large populations and need to import food. <clears throat> so that's important as well. But in far as, the, as far as the environment is concerned, the Industrial Revolution may be the thing that ends up killing us, right? Um, if we can't use our science and technology um, to control the damage we're doing to the environment, or we can't reduce the amount of pollution that, that is, going, is happening around the world, we are going to, like uh, bacteria in, in a Petri dish, um, 
if you ever did that experiment in high school. I don't know if Koreans do it, but uh, we did this in biology. You know, you put a bacteria on a, in a dish and it's got an agar plate in there. So it's, it starts multiplying like crazy and it takes over the entire plate. The back, bacteria grows and grows and multiplies and multiplies, but it ends up pretty much um, living in its own waste uh, as, as it consumes all of the available resources in the dish. It gets to the point where it covers the entire area and it's living in its own um, pollution. And uh, it dies. The whole thing dies. Um, I would make a I would make a reference to the Matrix here, but I know some of you have never seen that movie, but you should. In the Matrix, um, that's what Agent Smith calls human beings. You see, I figured out what human beings are uh, most similar to. They're unique organisms. You know what human beings are? They're they're viruses, right? Because a virus can't live by itself. It's going to it's going to multiply and multiply and replicate and replicate until eventually it destroys the organism that it's it's occupying and then it'll destroy itself. Um, so it's a, it's a natural limit um, to the expansion of, of the organisms or of the viruses. If I, I technically a virus is not an organism, but this is this is what we're and we end up doing. Um, of course, the Industrial Revolution in England. Uh, took advantage of slaves. It took advantage of children uh, and the working class. Um, many, many people started moving from their cottages and their houses in the countryside where they were producing um, cloth, usually from wool in, in England uh, in Scotland. But uh, as uh, cotton became dominant uh, and wool became a less common commodity, um, people started moving to the city and uh, farms started getting larger, especially in the United States, farms started to get larger and larger. And um, the, the portion of people working in agriculture, which was enormous, usually way over half of the population would need to be in agriculture to support a large population, like in India or China, there was millions of people um, working in agriculture now, <clears throat> I think the percentage of people working in agriculture in Canada and the United States is something like three percent, and they do enough. They produce enough um, food to support the entire population and more. Right. So urbanization is a consequence. And urbanization, we already talked about how how dirty and deadly London was in the medieval period. Right. Uh, when King James came down to London, he, he thought he was horrified. He loved London because he, it's a lot, he was a lot wealthier when he became King of England and he stayed there, but he thought London was uh, really going to eventually suck all of England into it like a black hole um, and, that, and that it was a disgusting, uh, dangerous place to live, which is true because I told you the only reason that London didn't lose people is because of the constant immigration from the countryside which you know increased the population quickly even as more people were dying in London than being born which has been the, was the case for hundreds of years <clears throat> okay as the birth rate increased though and the, the mortality rate started to fall because of the abundance of food and because of scientific advance uh, advances um, understanding about eventually medicine and cleanliness and stuff like that. We, we talked about these things already um, with reference to um, British cities. The same is true of American cities that eventually the vaccines will start to come along. Um, and, uh, you know, American cities, Benjamin Franklin is one of the original people who was resistant to inoculation, which is the predecessor to vaccination, where you, you take cowpox, for example, which is a disease that's very similar to smallpox, and you, you introduce it to um, a person, and um, they get infected by it, and then their body builds resistance. So when smallpox comes along, um, they get a little bit sick or don't get sick at all. Their resistance is high. It's the principle behind the vaccines for the COVID you know, epidemic. Um, but originally, um, 
they noticed that this might be a possibility because uh, milkmaids, you know, cows would get sick and the milkmaids would get infected or exposed to cowpox by, <clears throat> by because they were, you know, um, milking the cows every day. And uh, they noticed that <clears throat> milkmaids almost never got seriously sick with smallpox. So what's the deal there? That's, that was uh, another revolution, uh, not an industrial revolution, but a sort of medical revolution that, that uh, enabled more people to survive. Because smallpox killed millions of native people, um, and it killed millions of, of Europeans too. So um, once they had something to, to control it and eventually eliminate it, right? Um, there's no smallpox uh, in the developed world anymore. Now they, they have samples of certain viruses. Polio and smallpox are things that nobody is worried about because everybody gets their vaccines when they're young. And uh, you don't have to, you don't hear about anybody getting those viruses anymore because everybody is vaccinated. That's, that creates another bumper um, lowering the death rate. Uh, that makes populations increase. Now, <clears throat> importantly, we do need to talk about Nelson. I haven't given myself much time to talk about Nelson, so I'll expect you to read some of it. But basically, um, Horatio Nelson, he's one of my favorite military figures, along with Napoleon and uh, Julius Caesar, Alexander the Great, Genghis Khan, um, Yi Sun Shin for Koreans. Um, he, there, there's more than one great military figure in British history, but I think Nelson for me is the greatest. Uh, his story is compelling. Um, he had a unique personality, um, but we, we want to focus on what his effect on British culture was rather than his, his personal attributes. Um, he, he did command uh, these massive ships called Ships of the Line, um, and his, his uh, I told you already, HMS Victory was his flagship, and that ship was actually built during the Seven Years' War. Miraculously, it would continue uh, being in service for 45, over 45 years. So it was commissioned in the Seven, seven Years' War in the 1750s, but didn't get finished in time to really participate. Um, so from the end of the Seven Years' War in the 1760s until um, the, the wars against Napoleon, the, the HMS victory was on the ocean. It needed to be repaired and refitted and new technology like covering the bottom in copper to prevent damage to its, its wooden hull. Um, the bottom of the boat is called the hull. Uh, I don't want to talk about too many parts of the ship because that's difficult vocabulary, but essentially, um, Napoleon took over all of Europe. Uh, he was only stopped by his invasion of Russia. Um, but before that, just like Adolf Hitler, uh, he was focused on, it's, it's very, it's eerily similar how Hitler takes over all over Europe and Germany, fights against the United Kingdom, but is unable to invade. And then they turn their attention to Russia and then Russia um, stops them, you know, with their huge territory, mili military power and population, the Russian Empire uh, stops, and then the Soviet Union stops um, uh, Hitler <clears throat> uh, over 150 years later, uh, about 150 years later, excuse me, not quite. Um, anyway, the thing that prevented Napoleon from getting his army on ships and landing in the United Kingdom, which would have been the end of, of the British Empire, was um, the, these, the British Navy, the Royal Navy. That's the legacy of the Royal Navy. That's why <clears throat> from, from Trafalgar, when Nelson defeated um, the Spanish and French combined fleet um, with his own, captured half of them and sank the other ones, um, scattered the main, the main fleets of, of Napoleon to the, to the, to the fore you know, corners of the ocean um, in, in a battle very similar to something that Yi Sun Shin would have done 
in Noryang or Myangmyang or something like that, um, except that with a, a major difference is that the technology, uh, in some ways, the the ships the Koreans had had some distinct advantages. They were very different than the Japanese ships, and if they were commanded properly, um, could could basically avoid almost all damage. Uh, Eastern Shin was sometimes able to inflict huge amounts of damage with and only lose a few people by accident. Um, that's not the case with Nelson. He's He's got these gigantic ships. The French have the same kind of ships. So they're going toe to toe with the same technology. Um, just the British are better trained. They're better experienced strategically, tactically. They have the advantage because they have Nelson and he's a military genius, just like Eastern Shin was. Um, so he he um, takes out the in a series of battles, not just the final one where he dies, um, but in a series of significant battles. When Napoleon goes to Egypt, he sinks his fleet in the Battle of the Nile. He goes to Denmark and he sinks his fleet there. He goes to the Caribbean. He's all over the place, and he and he barely he rarely stays on land for very long. Like he's out in the ocean for like a year at a time, hunting. French fleets, not French ships, but groups. He's looking for these groups, and he finally finds them in 1805 um, at Trafalgar, off the coast of France and Spain. And he has his battle, and he gets shot, I think, through the lung. So he r dies in the middle of the battle, before the battle's even done. Similar to what happened to Eastern Shin, supposedly, where he, he was killed, and they just took him below decks, and they, they didn't tell anybody that their leader was dying or dead. Uh, nobody knew until the battle was over. So they won the battle and they were victorious and that was the end of the Japanese invasion and it was the, for Yi Sun Shin and the end of him. And uh, very similarly, Nelson um, is, is killed in, in the most important battle um, possibly in British history. There's a lot of important battles on the ocean in British history, but that one is, is the most famous. That's why when you go to England, <clears throat> uh, you go to London, you should go and see Trafalgar Square where there's a pedestal and on top of it is um, Nelson. That's in the textbook on page 208. I went there, I took pictures of it. Um, that was one of the things I, I had to see when I went to London, I've only been once. And um, in Trafalgar Square, in the middle is a pedestal. There's there's museums and art galleries, and there's Buckingham Palace and Westminster, Parliament buildings. Everything are are down the road, and there's this plaza. And in the middle is uh, Nelson, who also a cannonball took his arm off. So, in the statue, he's holding a sword in his good hand, and his other arm is um, he only has half an arm, uh, and he's standing there, you know, in his Vice Admiral uniform, staring towards France across the Channel, daring Napoleon to try and invade um, Great Britain, which is how the story goes. So read read it over. It's very interesting. What ends up being created by this battle and by the defeat of Napoleon is called the Pax Britannica, right? The the British peace. So from it's ninety nine years. From 1815, the Battle of Waterloo, which includes a person called the Duke of Wellington, but I, I won't include him on the test, so don't worry. We're not talking about the fall of Napoleon on the quiz or the exam, but this is what happens in 18, 1815. Uh, Napoleon is defeated for the second and final time. And um, from then until 1914 in World War I, there are no World War uh, pan-Europe like all of Europe fighting scenarios. There's, there's no wars of that scale. And uh, basically, the, the Napoleonic Wars, Napoleon's Wars started, you could say, I mean, the French Revolutionary Wars start in 1790 and continue, if you include Napoleon with it, it's 25 years. Um, that's how Napoleon became so famous, is because he was a, the most talented general of his generation. He was a genius. And that's how he became a political leader, too, because um, the way that you became powerful and influential was by winning battles. And he won a lot of battles. But 25 years of war 
will wear out a lot of countries. And uh, so the British had undisputed domination of the ocean for a hundred years until Germany challenged them and uh, other powers like Russia and Japan started developing navies too, and so did America. But for the next hundred years, it's the British peace that, that it is called. Charles Dickens. Charles Dickens is important because he sort of captures what it's like, the, what the culture is like during Queen Victoria's reign. Um, there's a lot to talk about when it comes to him, but I mean, uh, Oliver Twist, a Tale of Two Cities, A Christmas Carol. You guys, some of you not, might not know Dickens if you're not uh, an English major, but you probably know Scrooge. At least you know what a Scrooge is. It's a person who is very greedy and selfish, right? Um, Ebenezer Scrooge is the character that Charles Dickens invented um, for one of his stories. And uh, everybody uh, in any English uh, country knows that story. Um, Disney has done it with Mickey Mouse as as uh, the worker and uh, Scrooge McDuck uh, is a Disney character that's based on Charles Dickens character Ebenezer Scrooge. So he's he invented for one thing he invented the novel. Um, he, sorry he didn't invent the novel. Uh, he invented the paperback novel. Um, he invented the cheap long serialized um, story which some of his, his books are very long, so you have to remember most people read them chapter by chapter, not as a 800-page epic. That's not how he, he wrote them. He wrote them week by week, chapter by chapter, and released them like that. Um, he was a sort of financial uh, advertising genius as, as well as a literary genius, so you have to remember the, the adjective Dickensian. Um, this also has a lot to do with he was very anti-industrialization. He, he criticized capitalism and uh, factories uh, and the environment and child labor exploitation and those things too. These are all Dickensian things because uh, they were co uh, common um, reappearing themes in his work. Jane Austen often is, is referred to by feminists, um, in good and bad senses, but um, she she was a <clears throat> very early uh, female famous female writer, and she she had to release her her books um, anonymously. That they weren't you know Sense and Sensibility or Pride and Prejudice by Jane Austen. It was written by somebody. Um, she couldn't even put her name on it because women were not supposed to write. So whatever you think about her writing style and her her subjects about female social circles and and social status and uh, you know relationships between men and women and and female roles and she she was a groundbreaking force and uh, any person who wrote whether as male or female afterwards um, had to really um, pay some homage I think uh, to Jane Austen's contribution to you know the sort of eventual reorientation of writing to be anybody's. Anybody can write, poor or rich or, or um, female or male or young or old. Um, everybody could, was allowed and should uh, write if, if they have the creative um, impulse to do that. I think this is uh, gonna be one of the longer lectures this semester. I'll conclude today um, by pointing you to the father of American literature. Now that's my own, that's my my own um, twist or my my own stamp. Uh, I'm calling Mark Twain the father of American literature because he uh, he he writes in a way that's different. Uh, Edgar Allan Poe is my favorite American writer, so I'm not saying this to give Mark Twain you know a leg up on anybody. Edgar Allan Poe is my favorite. I, I like American Gothic. I like his poems. I like his uh, short stories. Um, I have all of his his uh, work in one gigantic book with a raven on the front. Um, so Edgar Allan Poe is my favorite. I'm not saying he, that Mark Twain is the best, okay? Same thing with Chaucer. Chaucer is the father of English, not the best. Shakespeare is the best, in my opinion. Um, but whatever you think, 
his influence was gigantic. He was a, he was a political force. Um, he wrote Huckleberry Finn, and other, his other writing isn't on the same level, and it wasn't as well known or or influential. But Huckleberry Finn and Tom Sawyer, The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, um, with with the the way that he wrote, um, writing realistic dialogue, um, writing the way people actually talk, and addressing you know fundamental issues. Like I said, the Civil War made uh, slavery. Um, illegal, right? Uh, officially, all the slaves were, were freed, but there was still um, exploitation and discrimination going on, um, still going on now. So, it, you know, over 150 years later, it still hasn't been solved. And he was had the courage to write about this, um, despite all the criticism of, of um, you know, uh, basically water, not watering down, um, basically um, making writing less morally elevated, right? You're not supposed to, people didn't think you're supposed to write the way people spoke. You're supposed to write the way people should speak, right? Like Shakespeare did in iambic pentameter and in rhyming soliloquies and, and poetry and stuff. But people don't actually talk like that. Um, you know there's a difference between writing and speaking, but his writing style was to get closer um, to the way things um, actually were and portraying uh, American society the way he did had a huge influence on all kinds of people's writing um, from then until now uh, I think for me um, maybe people like Hemingway um, or the the great female writers in uh, American history too um, since him uh, all um, whether they're African American or Mexican American or <coughs> Anglo American like him, they they all, you know, have benefited from him, sort of breaking down the the limits and and um, showing that other things were possible when you're writing a novel, and that brings us to the end of chapter six. Somehow, um, I I did like I say I did gloss over. Nelson a little bit, so make sure you read that part uh, carefully. I, there's a lot of information in the in the book. I spend uh, multiple pages writing about him, so read that over. And uh, that's it. Um, that's a wrap. And our we have our last quiz on Friday. So thank you for listening again, and uh, I will see you on Friday.